I had a chance to go to the Music Box Theater here in Chicago and see Eddie Muller from Turner Classic Movies come here. Um, it, it's a regular festival year round. The Film Noir Foundation puts it on. I, I happen to enjoy these films considerably, and I think many people do. And I uh, made sure that I got out to see the movies that were on the list for this program this round uh, they were celebrating 75 years for uh, a number of these movies so before i get to the three that i selected i mean 75 years think about this and you've got key largo uh with humphrey bogart and uh and you've and uh i think that's a uh, lauren bacall i think so and lady from shanghai uh, Orson Welles, and then Call Northside 777, um, and that's a Jimmy Stewart noir. And then uh, there's The Naked City, which is uh, a kind of a documentary style noir, but was monumental for uh, what it did. It's unlike a lot of the cookie cutter noirs that were produced from during the time period. Then there's I Walk Alone with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas is in that movie. And then uh, there are a couple good, really remarkable genre pictures, Cry of the City and Raw Deal that were shown on the bill as well uh, to wrap up the festival. And they were screening other noirs if you're really into this, like Blood on the Moon, Moonrise, larceny the velvet touch he walked by night so i went and saw force of evil and the big clock and unfaithfully yours i'm gonna discuss those today because whoa i mean that those are three phenomenal movies to sit down and watch with an audience uh to take in with a kind of festival crowd that's there and then to be there with Marzar, Eddie Muller, who can just give you the background and context for what made these movies work, what made them not work. You know, these movies, um, you know, actually, I think, you know, Force of Evil, we're going to get to that didn't do very well, but it's now accepted as a kind of enduring classic. Uh, so let me put this here on the screen for you. I mean, I don't know how many people coming to this will be familiar with this movie, but it was directed by Abraham Polanski and he didn't make a lot of movies because he was blacklisted and was investigated by the house on American activities committee. The FBI had his phone wiretapped when he was working on this movie and they recorded his conversation with Ira Wolfer. It was the author of Tucker's People, which is the novel that the film was based upon. And this movie is a kind of an indictment of capitalism. It's built around the numbers racket. It takes place on Wall Street. It is obviously speaking about Wall Street and likening it to the crime that was intrinsic to the numbers racket. And what we see unfolding is, uh, you know, it's an, it's an instructive film. And because he was calling out capitalism, it really had people who were working for J. Edgar Hoover worried that uh, this kind of a movie could be more common. And so you have John Garfield, and uh, he's on the right here. And then you have Tomas Gomez, fantastic character actor, who I think steals many of the scenes in this movie. And I'll read to you now what uh, Martin Scorsese has to say about this. I had seen this movie before when I went and, and watched it in theaters. And... Uh, Scorsese says Force of Evil appears on the surface to be a tightly structured 90 minute B film, but it's so much more going for it. 
the moral drama has almost a mythic scale. It displays a corrupted world collapsing from within. In this respect, Force of Evil is very different from other film noir. It's not just the individual who is corrupted, but the entire system. It's a political as well as an existential vision. So that's Martin Scorsese's summary of it. It's a very influential film for uh, for Martin Scorsese, and you know, it definitely uh, helped him to style some of his work later on. Uh, as you're watching it unfold, I, I, I can see some of the storytelling elements uh, were pulled from this movie for like Goodfellas or maybe even Casino because of just what he does. And, and those aren't indictments of a system per se, but you can see how a filmmaker's influence uh, get worms its way into Scorsese's productions. But yeah, here, so uh, someone watching, you're, you're absolutely right that John Garfield was driven to suicide by the McCarthy crazies. And they absolutely got to him. And he was also in Polanski's first movie, Body and Soul. It's a boxing movie. And uh, so this, this film is, as they said, 90 minutes long. It's tight. It's a genre picture. And I think the, one of the cool things about this movie is that Polanski understood that uh, you got to make a movie that's entertaining. And then once you have that, once you, when, when you live inside of the genre of this, that you're able to pull in something bold like an indictment of capitalism to show people, you know, what you have to say. And it has all those elements of noir that we love. Our anti-hero, John Garfield plays Joe Morse. And then um, that's his brother, Leo. That's who Tomas Gomez plays. And then, you know, here he is. He's out in front of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, this is in the 1940s. So it wouldn't work like it does today but here he is going through his moral dilemma and when he begins as a character we're not on his side we're not we and and we're not we don't really get to be on his side until maybe the end of the movie if if we even are on his side when we get to the end of the movie and so here he is working through what's unfolding you know the idea for the scheme is that they're going to try to find a way to legalize this racket, this numbers racket. It's basically people coming in and putting down money on a number. Uh, they have their lucky number and they take three digits. It's going to be July 4th. And so the scheme is that people are going to come in and put money down on 776. And usually on that day, it doesn't hit because everyone wants to put money down and they think it's a really lucky number. Well, this, the, the con is going to be that this time it will hit. And when it does, it's going to wipe out all these different uh, banks that make the racket function. And Leo Morris is involved in overseeing one of those banks. He's uh, John Garfield's character's brother. And, uh, Joe Morse knows that people he works for this criminal gang is going to do this. And he's trying to find a way to get his brother to back out of this. So it doesn't wipe him out. And uh, so that becomes the catalyst for our story. And, and, and in the powerful way that it is told, you know, they are trying to wipe out their competitors. It's a lot like what you see in capitalism where, uh, you, you're both cozying up to the law. You, you want a kind of protection that you can get. Uh, the cops looking the other way or the, the investigators looking the other way. And then also you want to make sure the competition is non-existent so that you can exist. You want as much market share as possible. So, And as it, as it shows you what is taking place, it illustrates all the different facets of capitalism quite clearly. So this is a movie that uh, didn't really make that big of a mark when it first started. 
And here you see Beatrice Pearson. She played Doris. Uh, she's kind of um, naive, uh, but very innocent and pure character in the movie who Joe Morris takes an interest in probably for romantic reasons, but also, you know, she, she's there uh, uh, trying to help him, even though she knows that he's been taken in by this kind of evil operation. And, uh, but after this movie, she didn't really go on to do anything else in movies. She decided to quit. Um, so uh, that's an interesting backstory for her. Uh, but here they are, uh, and I, I love this final shot here in the final sequence. I'm not going to say what's happening here. If you haven't seen the movie, you should seek this out. Uh, but here they are by the lighthouse. And in fact, this lighthouse that's in New York, it appears in a neo-noir that was done by Jane Campion later called In the Cut, which has Mark Ruffalo and Meg Ryan. And uh, that, there's a scene in that movie that takes place at this exact location uh, this kind of a bit of a, uh, I don't know if it's iconic, but uh, I know two of the movies in which they've produced uh, scenes nearby that lighthouse. So I, I, I recognized it when I saw it the second time around. It's a great picture. Um, and uh, Polanski uh, figure that uh, there's a movie called Guilty by Suspicion that's about him. Robert De Niro plays Polanski in that movie, exploring McCarthyism um, and what he went through. And then right now, um, Eddie Muller said that he's actually working on a project in which he's interviewed many people who were taught by Abraham Polanski, who after he could no longer work in film, he became a professor who taught people and there are uh, directors. There are people working in the movie industry who came through and learned the craft from him. So uh, this is a project that allows people to appreciate someone who had their career stamped out because of the hysteria or the panic that was the red scare. So, uh, now I would like to uh, go on to the second movie that I had a chance to see as part of this festival. That's The Big Clock. Uh, the Big Clock is just a up and down, fantastic noir. Uh, there, there is a bit of a social backdrop, maybe not quite the kind of uh, socio-political movie that can make a, a statement, but this is based on a novel that came from Kenneth Fearing. And so in that respect, it is somewhat political because Kenneth Fearing was a contributor to um, a magazine or a publication that was Marxist and it was called The New Masses. Um, and uh, he, he himself, you know, he, he, he put this together. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me get the, if I can get the description up for you for this. Uh, you know, he had as his backdrop, he had as his, uh, for his backdrop, the, so the, so uh, let's see if I can get the, trying to find this remarkable description from Kenneth Fearing's work on this in his, so he was a poet. Kenneth Fearing was a poet and he worked on those. And then he, he went to fiction and he only wrote a few books. So here it is. Uh, I just, sorry, I just love this description. So I had to him and haw and, and get this for you. The menacing ambience of dislocation that permeates the big clock is structurally and symbolically rendered as industrial capitalism, a socioeconomic order in which the avenues of communication, especially publishing and the airwaves, are evolving into a science of planned manipulation designed to ensure profitability. Well-paid deceivers, together with the naively deceived, are imprisoned as cogs in the apparatus of private enterprises' modern institutions. The genius of the big clock is its provisioning of the manifold mythological dimensions of a consumer's republic that would typify 
the era. And that comes from a historian of the American left known as Alan M. Wald, who you know, said that this novel was a kind of psychosexual Roman noir, stressing the sinister effect of market segmentation in the publishing industry. Now, okay. I don't know if I quite entertain that. Um, and, uh, uh, Actually, uh, I don't know if the director of this movie, John Farrow, has any relation to Ronan Farrow, but that's interesting because Mia Farrow being in the movies, maybe there is some kind of lineage. I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, but thank you for raising that, Soccer. That's a, gr- that's a good catch for this. Um, so this has a kind of left-wing, a kind of socio-political backdrop, but the the movie that we get from Paramount is it's not really saying a whole lot other than taking advantage of existing in this space where it's in it's inspired by Henry Luce um, and uh, the characters that we see. We've got Ray Milland playing the George, playing George Stroud. And then you get Charles Lawton, who's I just, well, let me get through all the actors first. So Ray Milland, he's known for Dial M for Murder and The Lost Weekend. Um, we have an actress, Marian, Maureen O'Sullivan, playing Miss, Mrs. Stroud. She was in The Thin Man. George McCready, known for Paths of Glory, and Gilda appears in this. He's a kind of henchman for the uh, tycoon and there next to Ray Milland in this photo, we have Charles. Oh, okay. Well there, that does it. This is why it's great to have people following along. John was me and his dad and Ronan's grandfather. And he did this movie. So it's a, it's a, and it's fantastic. And so Charles Lawton, uh, I absolutely love him in advising consent which is a fin- which is just a really exceptional movie tinged with politics and then uh witness for the prosecution probably one of the top 10 best courtroom dramas ever produced it deserves to be in any top 10 list for courtroom dramas and every time that it, this actor appeared on screen um, he chewed the scene. He uh, and and so I'd like to show a clip. I haven't done any clips on this show. I'm usually not sure if I can get away with it, but I don't really care if YouTube wants to flag this because I'm going to show you the entrance for this movie. Um, and what you see is a good way to establish what is going on with this world in which uh, a standard kind of noir, um, well, it's actually not standard. It's very creative, actually, uh, because we know who's done the murder. Now we're just trying to figure out who's going to get in trouble for it. But here, before all of that happens, uh, this is the entrance that Charles Lawton's character makes, and it's... I saw this with a group of people and we were all laughing and engaged and it's one of the best crowd pleasing performances. So let's watch this. It's like 220. Let's enjoy this. And uh, is solely on the subject of increasing circulation. The figures for the second quarter have fallen off badly. From a monthly high of 33 million in January, we've had a 6% recession, a loss of almost 2 million copies. In some cases, we are below the circulation levels we have guaranteed our advertising. Mr. Janus is very upset. He's going to want ideas. Sit down, gentlemen, sit down. And I resent this, I resent this deeply. For the 2,081,376,000 seconds in the average man's life, each tick the proper beat of a heart. And yet you sit here useless to taking your lives away because certain members of our conference are not on schedule. Where is George Stroud? We're always trying to find him. 
I do not propose to be held up, not even by Mr. Stroud. And that's all I'm able to show. YouTube stopped my live stream, and then when the video archived, they blocked it for violating copyright. So I re-uploaded this video without the full clip, and if you want to watch it, you can go find it on Twitter. That's how you could look for it. Use the text in that tweet, and then you can find the character entrance for Charles Lawton that I had wanted to share. And so, uh, yeah, they have all these divisions. It's it's a bit of a, like, Acme thing. And uh, each of the publications are all just, you know, cookie cutter, c- crime ways. They have uh, art ways. There's sports ways. And uh, the, the news division is news ways. And they're all there to just churn out and uh, get subscribers and uh you can imagine this being the way that uh studios work now with the streaming services what's going to get us eyeballs what's going to get us subscribers uh give me our idea for getting the next ten thousand subscribers and and then if it's a really shit idea you embarrass the person and make them sit back down so just the corporate boardroom here uh of the time uh, but also, boardrooms like that are functioning this manner today um, in New York and L.A. And so uh, this is before the uh, murder takes place in the movie, the catalyzing event. I uh, don't want to give too much more away. I just really think you should take a moment to watch this if you like the genre of noir uh, just like I do and here's uh, and here is uh, George McCready and then there's uh, you got Charles Lawton and uh, so the next movie is Unfaithfully Yours and uh, had a chance to round out my experience seeing some of the Noir City Film Festival selections by watching a spoof of Noir. And people have said to Eddie Muller, as he told the audience, is there a comedy that exists? I've watched film noirs. I enjoy it. Did anyone ever do anything funny? Well, there's this movie from 1948 from Preston Sturgis who also has a kind of association with the left or at least the new deal left. Probably. I I don't know if he ever made it too far into, you know, communism or anything like that. I'd have to go brush up on my Preston Sturgis history, but he's a populist and he is someone who made movies like uh, Sullivan's travels, and Palm Beach Story, screwball comedies, they're very good. And then he put his imprint on noir. And what's fascinating about this movie is in 1948, as it comes out, it was actually written um, before noirs had surged in their popularity. You look at this year, 75 years ago, I I named to you uh, several movies from the genre that are enduring classics and he put this together before noir was something that was a dominating genre um, in hollywood with a, with a and b movie pictures being put out by the studios in double bills that could be watched at theaters and uh this movie is somewhat wrapped in tragedy So let's get that out of the way and then we'll go back to what is joyful about watching this movie. Uh, But you have Rex Harrison in this movie. And at the time when it came out, uh, there was the death of Carol Landis, an actress whom rex harrison had an affair with she took her own life the year that this movie was released and this had a devastating impact on rex harrison's career 
he was not, uh, you know, he, he was complicit in her death because he waited several hours before he called a doctor and police who then found her, her body. And so uh, maybe she could have had her life saved. Anyways, this was something that overshadowed the release of this movie and it did not do well. And you could say maybe it doesn't deserve to do well anymore. It hinges upon Rex Harrison's performance, but also, you know, I think if you can step back and appreciate all the other people who were involved in making it, it's fair to still enjoy it. And once that detail was shared with the audience, you know, we all plowed forward and found this movie to be quite hilarious. The whole entire theater uh, had the, the like laughter would just ripple as we were watching this movie and it is it was really one of those movies that you are happy to be with a group of people while you're watching there are these scenes that are performed during it where uh he is orchestra director and he's there uh, and then it goes and it becomes a dream sequence uh, it's a cut it's a spoof movie it's and it's spoofing noir before it really even knew, knows what it is spoofing uh but that's the way audiences interpret it we understand it and so there's slapstick scenes there's all sort of nutty nits happening and uh plays on words and just uh it's uh one of the better screwball comedies that that i've seen and and you know Unlike the other two movies, there's nothing social uh, as far as like any statement that can be made. I just enjoyed the hell out of watching it. And I was glad to be in a room with people who felt the same way I did about, you know, being there and taking time to watch it. And, and that's why I'm here. And I'm glad to be here to talk with you about these movies. And so uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, let's see. Um, Yes, uh, like when uh, uh, High Anxiety is a good example. Those are Hitchcock movies. But yeah, Hitchcock had um, elements of noir in many of his films, or at least mystery films. Uh, I suppose this is up for debate whether Hitchcock was a noir director, but certainly he's a top-notch mystery film director. Uh, there were crimes in in them, but I don't know if the style of the movie always matched up with what, uh, but I don't know. We're, we're, we're we following anti-heroes um, all the time. Sometimes we were, I know strangers on a train. Uh, I, I think we're kind of rooting for that uh, whole scenario to uh, like, we're, we're watching with amazement at whether, it's going to succeed that he's going to convince the two people to commit the murder that, that the two murders will be committed and, you know, see what happens if they're able to get away with it. But um, in any case, it's a good observation. Yeah. Um, later on that, that came along, but that was in the seventies. So we would have been removed from the noir era. So high anxiety would be a callback to that era. But at the time, you know, it's, I think people are right. There's really no comedy movie that uh, brought that in. All of noir is, is very serious. Some of them funny, though. Like, look, The Big Clock. People were laughing at scenes in it because the cat and mouse game between Charles Lawton and Ray Milland is one that creates moments of humor and just works perfectly. So let's see. Um <laughs> I do like that. I mean, that accent that Charles Lawton does, like, wow. Um, um, I don't know. I don't know when people stopped doing it. But there was a point, and maybe 60s onward, some of the more cartoonish accents fade from cinema, and people realize they have to be um, more realistic. 
or else they're taking people out of the drama of the movie. But Charles Lawton could pull off that kind of stuff. So um, thank you for being here. Uh, oh, that's a good question. And welcome to the show, Perus Sataja. How would you rank the third man in the film noir genre? Is probably my personal favorite at the moment. And uh, I would rank it up there. Um, I don't know if it's uh, at the top of my list, but it's a solid movie. I mean, look, I'm not going to sit here and say that Orson Welles didn't make a incredible movie and it's very beloved film. Um, I happen to have others that I'm more, more personally inclined to recommend to people, but, but this one is, I mean, this one's good too. I mean, there's another movie, movie 75 years old. That's called the narrow margin that came out this time or no, sorry, not the narrow margin of sorry, wrong number. Sorry, wrong number. It's just like, it's great. And uh, that one, I believe has Barbara Stanwyck in it, who we're not going to celebrate here in the show for her politics. She was a conservative, but whoa, like a great leading actress in movies that were noir. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see anything else. I'm going to wrap up the live stream, but I'm aware there's a delay and people see things happen like they see that the clip on Twitter has stopped playing. That's just where it stopped and there was no more to show, but it captured what I wanted, which was to uh, show you how marvelous that entrance is that he makes there. And it's a great setup. And there's only one scene before that in the movie and then uh, everything goes on. So yeah, the, mil the movies for the show today were the force of evil the big clock and unfaithfully yours. Um, and I definitely, if you're looking for something to watch over the weekend and you have not seen either of these, uh, go, go, go to noir city with me and watch those. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, if you're in the United States, it's a holiday weekend and, uh, are you recommending a, let's see what it is. Oh yeah. Peter Lorre film. Ah, I do not, do not know of this one. I do not know of this movie. So thank you. So I, I give my recommendations. Someone tuning in um, shares this movie that I have not had a chance to enjoy. And so I'll put that on my list. Peter Lorre is a, is uh, always a joy to see uh you know in the same way that i enjoy the character acting of charles lawton the character like what he brings in that i don't know that's he's as he slinks around there's always something he's up to uh and he's always playing that that role he's kind of a rat right he plays that guy that could be the could, is is gonna get you in trouble He's that act. He's he plays that role of the person who you're pretty sure is going to be the one that makes things go wrong for you, um, or he's going to pull you into some trouble, and then you're going to have to figure out how to get out of it. Thank you all. I'll be back next week with some more celebration of movies. Until then. You all take care of yourselves. Goodbye.